Greetings from Hong Kong. My name is Anatoly Alexienko. I'm professor of international higher education at the Education University of Hong Kong. It's my great pleasure uh, to invite uh, two researchers uh, working on issues and problems of uh, higher education in, in East Africa, um, in particular in Kenya. So uh, we have today um, Dr. Mazarit Hailu from Arizona State University, who uh, does research on STEM and minoritized uh, um, women in st STEM pathways in e East Africa and the United States, as well as Dr. Uh, Roseanne Giroux, uh, who is a lecturer at the University of Nairobi at the Department of Sociology, Social Work and African Studies. She does research on uh, and publishes on gender and sexuality, health, human rights, peace and security, and decolonization. Today, they will speak about uh, experiences of uh, women who pursue their um, uh, studies in engineering. So they they ask questions about what do these women really uh, study, how what they achieve, and why there is this little number of uh, women who stay in engineering profession afterwards. So. Uh, Without further ado, let me just invite uh, um, uh, Mesoret and Roseanne to share uh, results from from uh, from their project, and then we can uh, continue with our uh, questions and comments. Uh, Mesoret, Roseanne. Thank you so much, um, Roseanne. Do you want to go ahead and get started? Oh yeah, sure. If you, uh, so as uh, you, we have been introduced, I am Roseanne and my colleague, uh, Ms. Wright, and we did a small uh, study as part of a, uh, a broader work that we are thinking of uh, exploring on women in STEM. If you could move to the next slide, Ms. Wright. Uh, our presentation for today is organized in the following way. So we'll provide a background for our collaboration and our mutual interest and how we met. I am in Kenya and Meseret is in Africa, in, in, in uh, Arizona. And then we'll provide a research purpose for uh, the questions that we explored. And then we'll look at the context and methods and findings and implications. And then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, in terms of our background for our collaboration, Meseret and I met in 2017 at the African Studies Review Pipeline for Emerging African Scholars Workshop. Uh, hosted by the African Studies Association in Accra in Ghana. And we, in that meeting and workshop, we explored our interest. I am interested in gender and sexuality and human rights and Meseret works in higher education. And we thought about collaborating uh, uh, together in higher education as people who are also working in higher ed and just to bring our interest uh, together. So in 2020, uh, Meseret actually applied and got a grant from ASU, Arizona State University, to conduct a comparative study in Eastern Africa that's titled Women's Pursuit of Undergraduate Engineering Degrees in Eastern Africa, Exploring Higher Education Retention in Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda. Today's uh, presentation and data that we have so far comes from our small Kenyan uh, study. So in, in terms of our purpose and our research uh, uh, question, we are really looking at how women in engineering uh, majors describe their learning environment in the engineering laboratories at the University of Nairobi. We do know that women's full participation in, in higher education is a concern globally and that uh, gender biases in STEM impacts opportunities for students, faculty, and women in leadership, and that globally, multiple factors contributing to women's underrepresentation in STEM include insufficient parental leave, few women in leadership positions, and a dab of professional uh, uh, networks, according to uh, stati uh, data from uh, 2013. So this really drives our uh, interest in exploring the ways in which women in engineering uh, transit from secondary schools and their experiences in engineering labs at the university as they uh, progress further in their careers and to advance a career in engineering. Next, Ms. Wright. 
So our study context uh, in thinking uh, about uh, uh, Kenya, Kenya is home to about 51 million people and as one of the fastest growing uh, economies. Um, and uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, to provide a broader context, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa lags behind the rest of the globe in terms of uh, gross enrollment rates uh, and gross enrollment ratios in higher education, access to education for people 25 years old and younger, and, and uh, there's an interest in closing the gender gap between men and women, uh, in particularly in post-secondary school uh, education. Um, in Kenya, women make uh, up less than 30% of graduates from public institutions and less than 35% of graduates from STEM. Uh, among the 35 public universities that we have so far, the University of Nairobi, where we did this research in 2022, we began in 2021, there was a delay because of COVID. Uh, the university is the oldest and currently enrolls more than 800,000 uh, uh, students. Next, Ms. <clears throat> Uh, our study em em employed both quantitative and qualitative uh, data collection. So we had a mixed methods research design. In the quantitative phase, we did a stratified snowball so as to include all the uh, courses in uh, engineering. So we had representation from civil engineering. We had representation from spatial, geospatial engineering, mechanical engineering, and electrical uh, engineering. Uh, we interviewed about uh, 50 women with a very uh, closed uh, uh, questionnaire, uh, looking at their socioeconomic background, their satisfaction with pedagogy in the engineering laboratories, their perception of an inclusive institutional climate for, for women, and their aspirations in their career uh, progression. Next, Ms. Wright. Thank you. For the qualitative methods, we collected phenomenological data by conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews with 20 uh, students who were part of the uh, quantitative studies who were identified. We identified uh, uh, women that were participating in the first phase of the quantitative data collection and, and decided to explore further through very informal, open-ended discussions and questions around their individual experiences. Uh, we used a, a, an interview protocol that was about, that had about 15 very open-ended questions, but which lasted for more, sometimes more than one and a half hours and explored really a range of questions about their transition from uh, secondary to uh, university education, their interactions in the uh, classrooms, their experiences with the lecturers, their collaborative engagement with other students in class, uh, the ways they felt as women studying uh, engineering uh, at the University of Nairobi and their desires in progressing uh, a career in engineering. The interviews were conducted exclusively in the uh, English language, and we had actually trained a graduate assistant to help us to do these qualitative interviews. So we went through a rigorous training with the GA so that she would be able to understand what we were interested in looking at. And at the end of each interview, at the end of the day, we required that she provides a one-page memo that we would then explore with her just to ensure that we recorded and reflected on the discussions for the day, which would then inform further discussions in the following uh, interviews. Uh, and, and, and our data, before uh, Ms. Red uh, talks about our data analysis, we were guided by um, a, a framework. We did have a, a a theoretical framework to guide our work. We use the social cognitive career theory, uh, which emphasizes the fact that individuals do have agency in their professional development while still operating in response to their external forces, which might include uh, 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 gender and sexism and classism. And in, Af in, in Kenya, we talk about uh, ethnicity and other factors, external factors to their environment that might impact 
the ways in which the women in engineering experienced their life at the university, but at the same time recognizing that they do have agency and, and our data analysis actually did show spaces in which women did have uh, agency to pursue their career, even within an environment that was a little constraining for them. I am going to allow uh, Dr. Hailu to uh, uh, give our findings and our analysis and I'm giving her much more time, so I have tried to take as little time as possible because I'm sure you're more interested in hearing about our study findings. Thank you. Thanks, Roseanne. Um, so in terms of data analysis, we, um, for the quantitative data, you know, first cleaned the data and conducted univariate statistical analysis to summarize participant responses. Um, keep in mind that because this was an exploratory pilot study, um, the quantitative component relative to the qualitative component was fairly small. We had 50 respondents take the survey just to get a better understanding of the emergent trends amongst the student population. And then for the qualitative data, we analyzed um, our interview transcripts using an iterative process that involved reading, um, careful reading, open coding, and axial coding, uh, our interview transcripts to understand how women navigated laboratory environments. Now, because the qualitative phase is based on a phenom uh, phenomenological design, we uncovered the sheer essence of the undergraduate experience described by women at the University of Nairobi. So in terms of our findings, um, based on the analysis of both quantitative and quality, uh, based on the analysis of quantitative data, we found that about 50% generally of students um, saw their gender as a positive factor in succeeding in their academic environment, while another half um, considered it, uh, that they are being treated worse because of their gender. Similarly, um, those divergent opinions were also reflected in our qualitative analysis, um, but in our qualitative analysis, we were able to understand how the context um, of engineering at this university was also complex. Um, specifically, we found three uh, themes that summarized student experience, including the role of social and uh, cultural norms, the sources of support, the uh, source, so sources of women's agency and support, and the gender dynamics and interactions between students and lecturers. And today we'll draw from both qualitative and quantitative uh, data to show, to demonstrate, to substantiate these themes. Okay, so for finding one on the surface, we found that um, female students predominantly do not recognize how gender and gender related social and cultural norms impacted their learning environment. So oftentimes this meant like when we asked them head on, you know, do you feel like being a woman is a disadvantage or do you feel like things are more troublesome for you because you're a woman? By and large, um, women tended to resist noticing gender as an inhibitory factor, especially towards the outside of interviews, towards the beginning. So towards the start of the interviews, um, when they were asked about the challenges that women have in STEM programs and in engineering specifically, most women would say that everyone has similar challenges and that these challenges are not specific to them as female students. And to demonstrate this, uh, one participant shared, as you'll see on the slide, I feel like when you start going into higher levels in engineering, the uh, the clothes of you being a woman is just taken away. So that, you know, that's not meant literally. She's saying um, the impact of gender does not matter as much. So she says, you're not a man, you're not a woman, you're in this together. So yeah, it's not just for women, it's for everyone. So that is to say that engineering, because the courses get harder, the expectations become more intense, this is a more challenging environment for all students in general. However, in regard to this first finding, eventually later on in the interviews, um, we identified several salient factors that make the academic environment for female students ch more challenging in particular, right? So for example, in the first year of college, uh, the experience seems to be the most challenging for women who studied in all girls high schools, for example. 
And those students tend to struggle in their transition from high school to college, both academically and socially. Um, in terms of academic readiness, they describe themselves as more disadvantaged compared to men because they did not learn the subjects that their male peers did in STEM areas. So they didn't have the prerequisite knowledge to their coursework. They weren't prepared uh, for this. They don't feel like they were adequately prepared academically. Um, for the coursework of engineering. And then um, socially, they feel like they're not used to the dynamic of having female or male classmates, uh, which makes you know learning and adjustment much more arduous. So to this end, one of our participants in the interviews who had gone to an all girls high school shared, you know, it was quite turbulent. My high school was not in a city environment. And also I wasn't in a mixed school setting. So coming to this university in Nairobi and also coming to a class full of guys was quite turbulent for me. There are uh, these subjects that were offered at boys high school, for example, electricity, metalwork. Uh, so they are quite acquainted to what was being taught at the time. Um, then girls on the other side who were learning home science, right? So this idea that both socially and academically, um, this participant felt like she was not well prepared. So it's interesting, right? So, you know, at the outset, when you ask students head on, do they feel like they were minoritized? Or do they feel like they were disadvantaged? Um, there's sort of a defensiveness around, no, I'm just like everyone else. I'm qualified. I'm supposed to be here. I'm smart. Um, and being a woman doesn't matter. But when you really tease out um, specifics about their experience, you'll see how gender is something that matters um, and does shape student experience, but it just requires a little bit more um, probing, um, which is helpful, uh, which is, you know, something that we are well poised to do as um, people well versed in qualitative work. Uh, in terms of being able to find sources of support and agency, um, we found that regardless of highlighted challenges, uh, women tend to not express, um, like we said, um, that these challenges impacted their academic success or achievement. Um, moreover, while women tended to highlight the kind of support that could be helpful if it was provided by their university, the institution, they demonstrate a high degree of agency and responsibility on tackling the issues uh, that they face um, due to certain cultural and social norms on their own, right? So they very much have a sense of self-efficacy and personal responsibility that they take really seriously. So when we would ask them about, you know, how they deal with challenges um, in engineering, they would respond with sentiments like, oh, it's all about my personal drive. It's all about me. I must go to class. I must do my assignments since at the end of the semester, the results are all mine. And another student highlighted, you know, so I think women, we need to do more. You can't expect the government or institution to do everything. So women, we need to do more and empower each other. So I, I thought this was really interesting because female students, though they have, they describe not having received any kind of institutional support that would help them navigate the male-dominated environment. Um, they found that friendship between one another, um, responsibility for themselves, um, and just like a sense of self-efficacy and drive seemed to draw seemed to emerge as the main tool for confronting discriminatory attitudes. Um, Additionally, since there is this relatively small number of female students in engineering, it appears that they support each other with the attitude um, that we're in this together. We're always looking out for each other, right? So this idea that, you know, even if we're small, we're mighty in terms of our, our motivation to succeed within this discipline. To this end, one of the participants explained, if someone treated wrongly or a comment is made badly, you'd find that three or four or even most of us, that is women, whoever was available would come together in this just to tell the person you don't do that, right? This idea of being protective. And even if it's a small number of them, they are invested in one another's success and recognize the shared um, sort of like linked fate that they have as, as minorities in this space. 
So here we see a snapshot of the quantitative results, which show that the majority of respondents believed that they are very likely to finish their undergraduate program, right? So recognizing that they are small in number, recognizing that there's not a ton of institutional support or government initiatives that they recognize or understand as being something that promotes their persistence, you know, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly and we offered mostly Likert scale questions in the survey instrument, most of them thought they perceived themselves as very likely as um, finishing their, their program despite these challenges. In terms of um, our third finding, gender dynamic and interactions between student and lecturers, our analysis also revealed that the interaction and attitudes um, between the lecturers and students reflected gender uh, ideologies and gender bias. So the participants primarily highlighted that they have not noticed any different treatment towards the male or female students, when, again, when asked outright, although almost all of the lecturers are male, um, as self-reported by the, the women in this study. Additionally, so even though they said, no, we don't really see a, a big difference between um, how, we're how the lecturers treat male and female students. Some of our participants highlighted that sometimes they felt special treatment or attention from their lectures. Um, so, and female students also noted this from their male peers. So one of the students shared, for example, if I'm with male students and we go together to lecture, to request for something and the request is approved, our male classmates tell us, hey, that only happened because we had you, you are the female student there. So this idea that, um, even though they are not willing to sort of admit that there's a gender bias that exists, they do notice that they're able to navigate um, requests or extensions or explanations of assignments differently based on their gender. Um, and that, that appears differently between men and women. Um, moreover, students felt like they would feel more comfortable and safe to have direct communication with female students, female lecturers on academic or, or, or other issues. So one participant shared, most of our lecturers are males, and sometimes there's this fear to approach male lecturers because you hear stories out there and you're afraid. So I would appreciate if there are more female lecturers in the university. So this idea, and then, you know, I, we don't go into explicit detail here, but there's um, instances of sexual assault or rumors of sexual assault amongst um, students. And so they'll say, oh, you know, you wanna avoid professor so-and-so because, you know, I've heard X or Y has happened. Um, and so you see these gender dynamics appearing once again in who uh, our participants chose to go to to seek out academic or personal support. When it comes to our quantitative data, we found uh, that the findings from the interviews is also echoed in the surveys. So 75% of female students reported that they do not feel comfortable about one-to-one -one communication with their professors. Secondly, um, all of our participants actually shared that they would rather address their classmates, both female and male, than uh, to receive support that they need and also felt like they would receive the support they need rather than asking their professors. So this suggests that social interactions and friendships among students seem to foster a more communal rather than competitive institutional culture, and that gender may be playing a role since, um, especially when it's combined with level, right? So it might be more accessible to go to um, a man who's uh, a, a classmate as opposed to a man who is uh, a lecturer. And overall, we see in our findings that while students seem to take on a very um, individual level analysis in terms of personal responsibility as sort of seeing like systemic issues, right? So people, students seem to be reluctant to or um, not have the language to articulate systemic issues and gender bias as really pertinent or salient in their experience. We do see when we begin to probe or really um, go into the weeds of some of the quantitative results that there actually is evidence of gender bias and gender dynamics. Um, but, you know, for, for and we can postulate about why students may seem reluctant to name this outright. Um, so even if, so in other words, even if students are not willing to articulate these issues as being prevalent, they are indeed present. 
So what does all of this mean? Um, so overall, we find that our qualitative and quantitative data suggest that women at the University of Nairobi are experiencing discriminatory learning environments, especially, tory, especially in laboratory settings. And really zoom in on laboratory settings because these are the spaces where we find that students go from being just students of engineering to really doers of engineering. Because it's an applied field, you know, you feel you learn the skills and the confidence to become an engineer when you're in lab. Um, nevertheless, participants exhibited agency and seemed to find support in one another and also especially and also in um, women lectures, female lectures. Additionally, the data from this study suggests that there is an interplay between individual and institutional factors that shape how women experience engineering spaces and Kenyan higher education, right? So um, the courses that women are tracked into in high school versus college seems to be very gendered. So that's an example of an institutional factor at play. However, women in this study are very resilient and have a very strong sense of self-efficacy. And so they are determined um, to graduate, they were still obviously enrolled in the program at the time of our study. So we see that despite the challenging environment, um, they are very determined um, as an individual to succeed. And then finally, this work is significant because we found in our survey of the literature that few scholars examine the factors that actively promote the persistence of women engineering majors in emerging market contexts. So um, as you saw from the con from the study context slide, as Kenya strives to prepare technocrats that will enhance economic development, the quality of education is um, often sacrificed. So this study may inform the pedagogical practices of African faculty, in particular Kenyan faculty, who are committed to creating more inclusive engineering laboratory environments, especially because women um, are so reluctant to seek out the support of their faculty. Um, which is, you know, obviously a disconnect because faculty are there to promote student success, to teach and mentor. Um, so there's a huge disconnect between uh, what faculty are tasked with doing in terms of their work responsibilities and what students feel like they can go to faculty for. Alrighty, so with that, we will share our contact information for both myself and for Dr. Njiru listed here. And... Um, I'm happy to send out the slides to you as well, if you'd like. And uh, now we'll open it up to the audience for any Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hailu and Dr. Njiru. We, uh, we had great pleasure to listen to this presentation. Uh, I'll be awaiting um, questions or comments. As I mentioned, you please feel free to raise your hand or write your um, comment or question into a chat box. I have a uh, while waiting for the questions from my colleagues, uh, let me ask you a, a question about the economy of Kenya, because as far as I understand, Kenya is a dynamic economy in East Africa, trying to build some something which is part of the global neoliberal economy, if I'm correct, uh, and uh, to what extent women are expected to really to contribute to this type of economy? Just I'm I'm assuming my my knowledge about East Africa is uh, not 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 that kind of uh, significant. So please forgive me my ignorance ignorance. But at the same time, maybe you can just kind of enlighten us a little bit more about you know what exactly are, um, is expected from women in, in Africa in terms of building the society as well as the economy, what kind of transformation is, is there in, in the um, blueprints or strategies of, of the government and um, universities uh, uh, which, which contribute to the development of the society? Roseanne, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, yes, I am glad to answer that. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us, and thank you very much for your question. Oh, you are very right that uh, Kenya is a growing uh, economy, and we are now uh, ranked as a middle-income uh, country, uh, whatever that means in the global indices. 
And women do contribute a lot, particularly those in the informal uh, sector. There is, and particularly also in the rural areas in the agricultural sector, uh, uh, over half over 60% of the Kenyan population lives in the rural areas. Majority of those workers involved in the agricultural economy are women who contribute significantly to the uh, national uh, GDP. Uh, we have a Kenya Vision 2030 that outlines uh, different uh, pillars, including the uh, economic pillar that talks about the transformation of Kenya to, um, uh, in, in, to, to, to be able to compete uh, globally with other uh, so-called developed, uh, uh, developed economies. And there's a lot of emphasis both by uh, government and in government policies, but also in the private sector, but also within the public-private uh, partnerships, uh, the PPs, PPPs, as we call them, to advance the livelihoods of women so that they contribute even better to the national economy. However, obviously, there are challenges and gaps in the implementation of the ways in which we uh, uh, implement uh, our policies so that we are not particularly and very specifically targeting the interests uh, of women. We also do have all the livelihoods of women and recognizes their very significant uh, contribution to the national economy. Uh, in terms also of ensuring that we do have women in leadership positions that would also um, translate uh, directly or indirectly into having more women participate in, the edu in education and also in the economy. We have a constitution that talks about the two-thirds gender rule, so that uh, which really spells out that uh, any public sector government department should not have more than two-thirds of uh, a gender in one position. So there is um, there is a specific uh, uh, policy to have uh, uh, good representation of women a, a third, but a third or two-thirds, because the policy states that you cannot have less than uh, one third of the of one gender in 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 private in public enterprises and departments and government offices. Um, so the, I I think the answer to my to your question is the policies are there the uh, ideas are there to uh to, to include women in uh the national economy in education and uh, in leadership position. And there is there has been a bit of progress. So if you look at statistics over time, well, for example, if you look at statistics in enrollment of women uh, in education, if you compare the statistics of the 70, 60s and where we are at today, I think in in fact around 2015, 13, uh, there was only 0.3 percent of, of 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 not no, I mean the the there was only the female to male ratio was was at 0 0.3 and now we are at 0 0.7 so that's a significant increase in the number of women that have been enrolled at, in tertiary institutions so we do have the uh, policies and we do have the thinking around including women both in leadership positions and in education positions in the economic sector i, I think sometimes what lacks is uh, the ways in which we implement those policies mm. thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I can see I uh, saw a hand from a uh, reason from by um, James Otien or Joey. I'm not sure you, James, you would like yes. to ask questions. I'm here. I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, many thanks to our two presenters for a very illuminating uh, study. I'm James Joey from the East African community based in Arusha. I'm heading the education sector here for our eight East African countries. And uh, this is very useful for a study that we are currently undertaking on the barriers and uh, hindrances that uh, uh, female students face in uh, our higher education institutions. And um, my question to our two presenters is that we are mainly using an intersectionality approach in our framing of the study, where we are really seeing women or female students. Being a female is, is one thing, but there are many other factors that even make being a woman in a higher education institution even much more challenging. 
did you consider intersectionality and uh, the gender capability approaches within the study? And do you think it could have brought uh, maybe different interpretations to outcomes? But in addition to that, secondly, is uh, the, 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 the supportive frameworks that you looked at. I didn't hear of uh, any policy uh, positions which have come up recently or policy developments that are supportive to women or any institutional framework, support frameworks, uh, uh, policies developed within the institutions that actually make the position so women uh, better, especially the students. And uh, uh, what I generally got from your uh, presentation is that women seem not to be challenged by their being, they are having that uh, female gender, there is a lot of persistence, and seems that it's not really, really a challenge. Would that be so? Thank you. Sure, I can jump in with the intersectionality question and then the second, uh, the, the last question regarding about perception versus sort of reality of, of gender discrimination. And then, um, Roseanne, if you wanna maybe address the, the middle question. Um, about institutional, I think it was policies that you had asked about, um, James. Yes, but... yes, any institutional frameworks, policies, because uh, we see, for example, in Kenya, there is some um, there are developments in uh, very positive policies that support uh, not only female students but also all students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, and there is some progress. So, did you take some critical analysis of these policies, whether they are adequate or? Uh, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so we definitely did take, um, so we, uh, intersectionality theory was not our guiding conceptual framework in this piece. However, we do apply those tenets, I think, both of us as researchers. And so um, in the quantitative survey, for example, we asked questions about um, ethnicity, religion, um, birthplace, and other demographic factors that could coalesce in positioning some women as particularly vulnerable, right? So a woman who's from an urban area who went to a, an uh, elite uh, private school coming from a highly educated family with um, higher socioeconomic background versus a woman who is from a, maybe a geographically peripheral region, from a poor background, from a rural region, um, who went to maybe um, a less well-resourced school is going to be very well. These two women are it's not destiny, but the uh, you know women from these sort of like different intersecting backgrounds are positioned differently once they get to the same university, and so that definitely does shape um, perceptions um, and ex student experiences. And I would actually even go beyond these sort of like um, these major categories that we often think about when it comes to educational attainment, like you know um, gender, in this case ethnicity. Um, class, I would also say birth order and, you know, familiar responsibilities when you're at home, right? Are you the eldest sister in a family of, you know, five and you have to help your family, um, not just financially, but maybe with care and things like that. These are all things that um, intersect and shape the student experience. And so although we were not able to get into the details of that in the presentation today, um, to answer your question directly, James, definitely, yes, um, you know, intersecting systems of oppression do position different students differently. Um, and as you can imagine, students who are at the nexus of multiple marginalities um, have a harder time, um, you know, individually, and they're structurally positioned to have a harder time. Um, in relation to your last question about perception versus reality, this is the conundrum that I found in this data. I've also done work in Ethiopia, which is where I'm from, um, about gender dynamics. And I can put a few uh, citations in the chat of different papers that have been published about this. There is a very immediate reluctance to, to, be, to be considered a minority. Like I, I would say by and large, in our study, we found that women, um, it's sort of like, have you ever talked to someone? You could tell they're upset, but you ask them like, hey, are you okay? And they say, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything is fine. That's sort of the perception that we got in the 
the students, right? So as individuals, I'm sure these students will be, you know, they'll do great, right? Like they'll graduate, they'll do fine. They'll enter the job market. They're very hardworking, resilient young people. Um, but we would ask them like, is there something, you know, going on like issues wise? And immediately they would say like, no, everything is fine. It's, you know, you have to take personal responsibility. But like I said, as you tease out specific questions and you ask them about specific interactions, um, moments they've had in class, moments they've had with peers, you'll see um, there is, a lot of gender-based discrimination. There's a very, a lot of issues where people, um, where their classmates and their instructors view women as aberrant and deficient when it comes to the skill set needed to succeed in engineering. There's instances of sexual assault. There's instances of um, preferential treatment for students from certain families with certain connections, right? So it's not an equitable, it's not an equitable environment, even though the policies are designed to be cre are created to be that way. Um, the equity is, it, and that's you know, there's not there's not an equi perfectly equitable environment anywhere, right? And in this university is no exception. Um, but there is a there is a disconnect between the initial response and and the lived experience, and I think that is really. Um, we, we we cannot like read people's minds and say like why did you say that if the reality is different like we can't but my conjecture is that it's a defense mechanism because you're already seen as an aberration in this environment right so if everyone is right so if i'm the only woman in a room full of men like clearly clearly there is um some sort of inequity there but me drawing attention to it might make that inequity magnified. So I think it's their way of sort of, it's in a navigational strategy that these women use. Um, I talked for a really long time, so sorry about that. And then um, Roseanne, I don't know if you want to address that second question, uh, Dr. Njiru, yeah, about the, institutional the, policy. Yeah, and I certainly do agree with you about intersectionality. We did ask questions. Uh, and also to mention that this study is really was a small phase study. We, it's also located within a broader study that we are exploring and collecting data. And we are uh, uh, exploring all those uh, issues. For now, we are just presenting just a minor, uh, a small subset of the broader uh, study that we are conducting. And I just want to emphasize what Dr. Hailu is saying as a person who also interviewed these women, it's not to say that being a woman is not challenging at the university, it's, that's not our conclusion. It's just that women do not explicit, explicitly speak about it. You've got to get into an in-depth conversation sometimes, it, uh, you know, and for, for a long time. And I think because also of the interview setting and that they are being interviewed, so they don't talk about it. Uh, as 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 uh, as a first uh, response to a question, so they just see themselves as women who have been called to do engineering, and they've got to make it as women. And then you explore more in depth, and they begin to tease out the nuances of what it means being a woman in uh, engineering and in a male dominated. Um, and then, uh, the, so let me respond to the question on institutional uh, institutional support. Yes, we do have at the University of Nairobi a gender policy. We do have a sexual harassment policy. We do have an HIV policy. We do have an, a guided by a, a broader national gender mainstreaming policy. We do have, in fact, training and development uh, uh, policy. And those are all policies that we are engaging with as we continue to analyze uh, 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 this work. So uh, thank you very much for pointing that out. But we are also looking at all those policies so that we see the ways in which they uh, uh, play out. But on asking uh, uh, women, as uh, Dr. Hailu has, has mentioned, even though women sometimes did know that there is a recourse, they still fear of, uh, for example, um, uh, going to male lecturers to ask questions because of, like she said, what they have heard out there and rumors about sexual harassment and the fear that they would probably have no recourse or just to uh, uh, not want to get into uh, get caught up in, in in that space. So whereas those uh, institutional support mechanisms do exist, uh, sometimes they do not very well support the women, or some women do not know about them, or in fact they do not want to be in spaces where they would have to go to higher authorities for disciplinary cases. And that did come out in some of the interviews that I have conducted. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so um, I have a question from uh, chat, Dr. Wesley Tedder, who is a 
um, at UNESCO uh, Bangkok office. He is asking. He uh, thanks for your presentation, which is very very inspiring and focused. And uh, he is asking about the role of international agencies like the World Bank, maybe or initiatives like the Africa Higher Education Centers of Excellence. Uh, to what extent they are involved or can uh, be helpful in uh, creating partnerships or uh, support in supporting women and men, especially in advancing research. So um, would these partnerships be meaningful? So, um, Mazarin? Yeah, I, I, I'll jump on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, and you're well, most welcome to partner with the University of Nairobi is very welcome in, uh, uh, to create partnerships with any um, uh, agency, department, organization, research, academic, and individuals to advance the interests of the university, of the faculty, of students, on, and, and of Kenya. So yes, they, they would be very open to creating partnership and to advancing research. So that's something that happens within the, uh, we do have in fact a position of a deputy vice chancellor, uh, research innovations and enterprise. And that's where, and we also do have a deputy vice chancellor's office for um, uh, academics. And that's where we would explore these partnerships. And you're mostly definitely welcome to advance the interest of women students at the University of Nairobi. Thank you, Mazur. Yeah, I would say I definitely agree uh, with what was shared. I think um, the other, to the second part of your question, how can partnerships with development being set scale be more effective in supporting women and men, especially in advancing research? I would say in in this con in the context of our study findings, it would be to provide additional resources for faculty development and then um, really incentivize a revamped pedagogy. I think pedagogy is a really wonderful place to start because um, it's immediate, right? So if you want to transform um, a major university policy or a federal policy, it'll take some time. But if you want to change pedagogy, I mean, if I'm teaching in class later today, I could do it immediately. And so whether it's um, like a train the trainer, uh, faculty development sort of approach, um, I think really interrogating some notions that we have around gender dynamics, um, making students aware of the role of faculty and really sort of demystifying the faculty student interaction is one way to do this. Um, and it, it could be really immediate, I would say. That's what I would add. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Bhog Chacha uh, has a question or, or comment. So would you like to just enter this time? Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Hailu and Dr. Njiru for your presentation. My name is Bhog Chacha. <clears throat> I'm a PhD student at the University of Nairobi and also a colleague of Dr. Njiru, who is also my PhD supervisor. Uh, and my area of research interest is on um, women in academia. So uh, in terms of uh, women working in academia lecturers, so this uh, uh, research was very uh, close to what I'm asking. Um, my question was, there was one of the findings that uh, I think uh, one of the respondents had stated that uh, as far as um, maybe interacting with the lecturers, it would be maybe a little bit better if she was able to interact also with female lecturers. So my question to Dr. Hailu and Dr. Njuru is um, whether uh, they feel that uh, maybe through their readings or through their research findings from this particular study or the broader study, what uh, exactly could uh, the university do to encourage the recruitment and retention of uh, female engineering lecturers so that they also serve as role models for uh, these uh, female students in engineering? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's definitely an ecosystems approach would be needed, right? So. Uh, I think what one of the things that our findings um, illuminate is that it's not like 
you cannot pinpoint one, you know, problematic faculty member and just say, you know, if we just got rid of professor and so-and-so and the way he interacts with students, everything else would be solved. Um, I think a multi, uh, a multi-pronged ecosystems approach that involves sort of um, promoting step engineering aspirations and career interests when students are still enrolled in college is really um would be helpful i think faculty development and pipeline programs and hiring initiatives that um really reserve spots for women um faculty members and targeted hiring initiatives at universities would also be a great intervention to increase the number of female faculty I would also say mentorship and development for um, women professors once they're already in place would also be important. Um, what we see oftentimes is that when a minoritized faculty member is hired in a department, then everyone is super excited that they're there and all maybe all of the students who share like those, any marginalized identities with that faculty member tend to flock to that student. And there's an increased burden of time and service for and for faculty, for minoritized faculty that are not present and otherwise. And in, in many ways, we end up reifying and reproducing the very thing we were trying to avoid, right? So if you have only one female faculty in a department of engineering and everyone is going to her, all of the women are going to her, then when would she do her research? When would she, you know, attend to her personal life? All right. And so, you know, would she then get burnt out and then leave the university or burnt out and leave academia? Right. So making sure we have faculty support once the women are there in those positions. I think taking this multi-pronged approach from when people are still in school to recruiting them and to supporting them once they're there is one way to really increase the number of female faculty and make sure that increase the number is sustainable as well. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just add that. Uh, so the you have highlighted all the factors and uh, the need to take an uh, an ecosystem approach. And uh, 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 Boke has been exploring these questions also at the University of Nairobi. And I can say, so whereas these uh, uh, solutions are recognized and we do the, know them, I think our work then as researchers is to also become a bit of activists so that we also challenge the institution so that they can. Uh, uh, clearly um, have interventions and very targeted interventions that uh, uh, seek to intentionally recruit and retain uh, women. Uh, and not just in STEM, really. I think it is in all faculties where we find that we have lower numbers of women, but particularly in STEM. So then our role is to not let this kind of research uh, sleep and just be presented in international forums, but also to take it to the institutions that are concerned and to agitate and to um, uh, make an appeal for the need to do this if we do want to have a more gender equitable uh, world and to transform economies in the world. You cannot leave uh, any one single person or one gender out. Mm. Thank you. I can see a question, which is a broad question from Dr. Yamanton in Cambodia about uh, the general higher education. I think it's a very broad question. And I see uh, 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 Dr. Hailu has proposed a number of publications, and I will share them also in um, our YouTube video when it's published. So in general, it's great that we have this opportunity to really learn more about, about uh, uh, Kenya and other countries in East Africa just uh, from uh, these little opportunities, we kind of uh, get insights into the developments, transformations in in uh, what we consider as a periphery of global higher education, right? It's not periphery in general, but it's it's a periphery in the discourse of global higher education and it should not be. So, um, but let me just probably given that we have little time left, let me just give uh, um, an opportunity for the question coming from um, Florence Nakama, Nakamanya at uh, the Makerere University in Uganda. She's asking um, to what extent the, this kind of stereotype um, in the, of the patriarchal society uh, has impact on uh, women joining science. So uh, if I interpret this correctly, so did this type of influence uh, also manifest itself in your study? I, I don't know if you would disagree with me here, Roseanne, but I would say by and large, no, right? So stereotype threat was not, um, 
it was not an upstream issue. I feel like women still demonstrated an interest in engineering and they were aware of the demographic disparities and they were still, that did not scare them off in terms of declaring the major or pursuing this as an interest or even their perception of their ability to become a successful engineer. I feel like they were not affected by stereotype threat in terms of their aspirations. I think where some of these um, gender dynamics that relate to stereotype threat appear more so is in the interpersonal interactions that they have and maybe their prospects post-college about entering the job market, right? So we, I think mo we didn't have, again, time to discuss it here, but many of our participants expressed skepticism about their um, the job market prospects. And I think gender is inextricably linked to that. Would you agree, uh, Roseanne? Or? Sure, that's uh, exactly what our finding is. And I think that's why we also, we also uh, isolated the theme on agency because the women that we interviewed did not come into this study saying that women should not do this, women should not do this. I think we are also dealing with a different uh, kind of generation of young women now that has been exposed also to the idea that there is need for uh, gender equity and the fact that the women also do need to excel uh, regardless of what field they are in. However, there are other nuances and, and constraining factors that uh, perhaps make them not uh, uh, progress. So I, I would agree with the, with, with Ms. Eret. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We're approaching the end of this, uh, of this um, session. Um, at uh, some point I heard from Ezra about uh, individual agency determination of women to overcome challenges that they face, right? But also I heard another message about this collective agency where women have developed solidarity in order to kind of to advance uh, their, um, you know, position, their, their uh, rights in, in studying uh, effectively, uh, comfortably probably, if I can use this kind of uh, term within the, the very difficult programs, which can be challenging for anyone. So so I suppose that there are some of these issues, and we, but at the same time, gender inequity is still the problem. And uh, not only in, in Kenya, but uh, all over the world. So in, in general, this is a huge problem. And I think we, we've learned today a little bit more about how it really, uh, how it's been addressed in, 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 the, in the context of of um, STEM education in uh, at the University of Nairobi, but also across a wider context, right, of of East East Africa in general.